Encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters we activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. It's not a flight you want to take so that you can share God's word. There are two spiritual realities that governs the operation of the spirit realm. The first reality that governs the operation of the spirit realm is called light. You cannot have authority in the spirit realm except as light and understanding is granted you. And so when a man is granted access into the realms of revelation, he begins to function in spiritual authority. When Job was contending with the Lord, arguing with God, why should this evil be happening? And God showed up in Job 38 and he said, who is this that darkens counsel by wars without knowledge? What God was making Job to understand was the fact that the things that were happening to him were uttered before the foundation of the world. It wasn't about the circumstances he was going through. It was about the testimony that his life will hold when the age is to come opens up because the book of Job happens to be the first book that was written in the Bible and so God was using the Job, the life of Job as a testimony of rugged submission and rugged loyalty and so it didn't matter what Job went through because at the end of the day in Job 42 verse 10 the Bible said God gave him double for everything he lost but God was opening his eyes to understand it wasn't about possessions Possessions are the least things in the spirit realm. But for you to be aligned, you need to have understanding. So if you have understanding, some of the situations you go through, they are situations of thanksgiving. Because when it looks as if you are losing, that's when you are actually covering a lot of mileage in the spirit. But it will take light. And that's why when Job realized it at the end of the travail, in Job 29 verse 4, he said, as I was in the days of my youth when the secrets of God was upon my tabernacle. He said, by light, I walked through darkness. So when a man gains access to light, he gains authority in the spirit. In fact, age in the spirit is a function of light. Because in the realm of the spirit, there's no time. And I will tell you why there's no time in the realm of the spirit. 
The reason there's no time in the realm of the spirit is because of the energy level. Those who understand the electromagnetic radiation, they will borrow some knowledge of physics to understand it. But I won't go into that. But age in the spirit is a function of light. The oldest substance in the spirit is light. Light was created before heaven. And if you study your scriptures carefully, you will realize that before God began to create anything, he dwelt in light. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 6, I think verse 16, it said God dwells in light that is unapproachable. And when Jesus resurrected, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10, he said he ascended above all heavens. So there is a realm beyond the heavens. It's called the realm of light. And the secrets of God are, are in the realms of light. And so when the man gains access to light, he becomes an ancient in the spirit. This is why authority in the spirit is a function of revelation. In Psalm 82 verse 6, he said, they know not. Neither will they understand. He said, they walk on in darkness. He said, I have said, ye are gods, because we are the children of the most high. He said, but because they don't know, he said, they will fall like men. That means what will make you operate like a god in this realm is not where you came from. It's the light that you carry. Because light confers authority. The second thing that imparts power and gives you an advantage and governs the spirit realm is energy. Energy is a language in the spirit. And even in the natural, if you are sensitive, you will understand. I can tell you, come here. You will be excited. I can tell you, come here. You will feel insulted. I can tell you, come here. You will feel I'm being sarcastic. The language is the same, but the energy is different. That means energy itself is a language in the spirit. Somebody can look at you and say, see how you look. It will be a compliment. He can say, see how you look. It will be an insult. Words, the same. Energy, different. So the spirit realm also operates in that order. It's regulated by energy. presence, two things we are very sensitive with of is light and energy. The reason I shut them down is because in a Bible study, what you need is not energy, it's light. Because if you follow the path of energy, it will become difficult to open scriptures. I said all of that to tell you why I told them to stop, because they were going on the pathway of energy. Meanwhile, I want to travel in the path of light. <laughs> That's for revival service. When we come to Bible study, the kind of songs we'll sing is When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, for the glory He sheds on us. sharing tonight for just 15 minutes I want to talk 
to us about some very sensitive things that we need to pay attention to in this season that we are in. We are in a very treacherous season and believers must be equipped so they don't become victims. Because the season we are in now, you don't just need intervention. You need to walk under the government of God's protection. And for that kind of operation to happen, there are biblical and spiritual positions that we affirm it. And so I want to talk to us quickly this evening on the 12th order of the spirit realm. There are 12 layers of the spirit realm. And each of those layers, when you function in it, there is a level of authority it imparts on your life. There are certain things you confront that you need a declaration of faith to address. There are other things that are coming your way. Faith won't handle it. What will handle it is discernment. So God will tell you to escape. There are other things that will confront you that you will not use faith, you will not use discernment, but you will use wisdom. You will know how to find your way around it. All of these are different kinds of authority that believers must walk in. If all you have is faith and everything you see, you are rebuking, casting out, you will sink. Because the strategies that are being deployed in this season are enormous. And so you need to understand all of the spiritual stratas that makes for authority in the kingdom. You know, the problem we have most times is that our knowledge of God is shallow. We don't know God so much. But because that's all we were taught, and I'm not saying this derogatorily, because some of the things I'll be sharing with you here tonight, I don't know all by experience. It came to me by revelation. It may take years for me to come into the experience. And so when I say we don't know God deeply, I'm not putting myself out as one who knows so much and others as being ignorant. That's not the point. I'm saying this myself inclusive. We don't know God deep enough. And because our knowledge of God is very shallow, and that's all we know, we only operate with God on that scale and on that economy. And the disadvantage with walking in ignorance is that it must affect you. It only depends on when it does. For some, it begins to affect them in time. And for others, they go through time, but it definitely will affect them in eternity because of the shallow knowledge they have. I give you an instance. For example, there are certain quarters where all they know about God is encapsulated in the doctrine of salvation. And so their relationship with God is only trapped around the grace of God and around the benevolence of God. And so when you come to such places, they are screaming loud what God has done for them in Christ Jesus. You will never hear them speak about what God demands them to do for him. In fact, when they are teaching on the doctrine of salvation, they stretch it so much that when they are dealing with some of the articles in that doctrine, you will see gross error because of the extreme positions they take. For instance, when you are teaching on forgiveness of sin, you will hear somebody tell you that even if I sleep with somebody's wife now, I'm forgiven. Because all they know about God is his mercy and benevolence. They don't know the judgment of God. Meanwhile, the judgment of God reveals God in a deeper level than the benevolence of God. Now, forgiveness is that potent. But forgiveness does not stand exclusively in the kingdom. There is something that also complements forgiveness. Whatever you do, God can forgive you and will forgive you. But you see, 
Even though you are forgiven, it doesn't mean you are exonerated from the consequences. This is where they don't know God deep enough. I give you an instance so you know that I understand the doctrine of forgiveness. There are three layers of forgiveness in the New Testament. And even those who teach forgiveness don't even know it deep enough. And again, I'm not being proud. This is just revelation by mercy. The first layer of forgiveness is in John, 1 John chapter 1 from verse 7 to verse 9. He said, if you walk in light as it's in the light, he said, the blood of Christ cleanses you. And then he began to tell you the programs that are set in place for your cleansing. And in verse 9, he said, if we ask for forgiveness, he said, God is faithful. If we confess our sins, he said, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What that means is that when you confess your sins, God does not just say, okay, it's all right. Spirits don't forgive. That's why the word cleanse came in there. For a spirit to forgive you, he has to wash away that offense. Because if he sees it, he will kill you. When God saw sin on Christ, he killed him. It didn't matter if he was part of the Godhead. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he said he made him that was without sin to become sin for us so that we will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The moment our sin, sins were transferred to Christ, God killed him. And so, the only reason God can forgive you when you ask, when you confess, is that you will be cleansed. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see that iniquity. That's the first layer of forgiveness. And you must, we must have seen the debate going around in the body of Christ whether we should confess or we shouldn't confess. There are some school of thought that say the word confess there is the word homologia. And homologia means saying what God says in consonance. That means when you sin, you don't need to necessarily come to God and say, Lord, I have lied. All you need to do is to come to God and say, I'm the righteousness of God. Because he died for me, my sins are forgiven. So you are not necessarily confessing the sin, you are confessing what Jesus did. And there's another school of thought that insists that in the Old Testament, which reflects this practice and this reality, when you bring the sin offering, the priest confesses your sin on the scapegoat, on the animal, on the sin offering, and it is killed. So you have to confess your sins to God. Now, whether you confess what Jesus did, or you confess your sins, at the end of the day, when God sees the brokenness of your heart, which is the very reason why you came in the first place, he will forgive you. Because if you make that confession and you are not broken, God won't hear. Because it's a contrite heart and a broken spirit that God does not despise. So regardless of what you did, whether you murdered, whether you fornicated, whether you lied, if you come before the Lord in brokenness, he will forgive you and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But there is another layer of forgiveness that even further buttresses the benevolence of God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible went further to tell us that even if you don't for confess, God will still forgive you because Christ has died. So in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he said, my little children, he said, these things I write unto you that you sin not, that means it's not encouraging you to sin. He said, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the propitiation for our sin. What that means is that when you sin, and the reason this is very important for those who insist that you must confess all your sins is because there are many sins you have seen that you don't even know. The only sins you can confess if you were to confess are sins of commission. Those are the sins you are aware of. The Bible says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That means fear is also sin in the realm of God. And in the realm of God, no sin is bigger than the other sin. Every sin is tantamount to death. And so the reason God provides in his benevolence a greater covering in forgiveness is the fact that 
you can't confess all your sins even if you wanted to because there are other sins that are even the sins of the heart they are not the sins of the flesh the sins of the heart are so deep that it must be revealed to you for you to be aware you can be aware of the sins of the flesh but the sins of the heart you may not even know because somebody may pass and you just despise the person and it doesn't even occur to you that you have erred somebody may be succeeding and you are afraid not because his success affects you and not because you wish him bad but the moment you heard that something good happened you became afraid oh why not me it's a terrible sin in the spirit and you may never confess it all your life and so if you say forgiveness will only be procured when you confess you are already doomed because much more than you know are the things you are guilty of and so because you cannot gather all the sins you have seen God decided that Jesus who is your high priest will become your advocate before the father and the advocacy of Jesus was already carried out on the cross because when he resurrected he carried the blood to the tabernacle of heaven because advocacy in the courts of heaven is not only with words it's also with blood that's why we call it the blood, the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. And so when the blood of Jesus was sprinkled on you in the courts of heaven, God considers that blood and forgives you your sins. And God does not stop there. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 12, he further showed us his love and benevolence. And he said, my little children. He said, I write unto you children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That means God comes to a point where he is not forgiving you because of you, your confession. He is not forgiving you because of what Jesus said. He is forgiving you because of his integrity. Because he has already put his name on you. And he has already declared you righteous. Because the moment you gave your heart to Christ, you were justified. The Bible said in Romans 5.1, he said, being freely justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the word justification means forgiving and acquitted. That means God did not just forgive you. God also recompensed you from the court of heaven. And so if God comes back to judge you, it's called the law of double jeopardy. That means the justice system of God is faulty. Barrister understands what I'm saying deeper than what I'm saying now. Because you can't convict one person twice of the same offense. If you murder somebody and somebody else is hanged for that murder, if you hang another person, it becomes a crime. So the, the righteousness of God and the justice system of heaven, we insist that God forgives you. That's why when John wrote in 1 John 2.12, he said he has forgiven you for his namesake. That means even if you didn't come to confess, because of the integrity of God he has already called you justified he has already called you acquitted because of what Jesus did so he will forgive you now because forgiveness is that profound what it goes to reveal is the love and the benevolence of God and that's what many people teach and they have kept many believers as babes and so they sin as much as they want but you see God is not known enough only in his benevolence because the judgment of God are deep. In fact, the highest revelations of God are known in his judgments. And so you will notice that after God forgives you and forgets all you have done, from earth, there are other consequences that is not necessarily the vengeance for your sin. For example, in Galatians chapter 4 verse 1, Hope you notice that all the people who are forgiven here are children. No elder was mentioned there. They are all children. So in Galatians chapter 4 verse 1, he said the heir, so long as he's a child, in the eyes of God, he's a servant. So God is not punishing you for your sins. He has forgiven you. You fornicated, he forgave you. You lied, he forgave you. But every time he looks at you, he's not seeing a son, he's seeing a servant. And because of that, you can never participate in the kingdom. Meanwhile, all they taught us was forgiveness. Whatever we do, we are already forgiven. 
whether we confess or we don't confess, we are forgiven. But the problem is that all the resources that is available to us that we should wield in the kingdom, we can't wield it. You call the name of Jesus, a demon slaps you. I think you are wondering, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Now, God is not the one punishing you. It's demons that are punishing you. Because the demons know that you don't have authority in the kingdom. You have all the revelation, but you are walking in iniquity. So the powers of the kingdom cannot be committed to you because the powers are for sons, not for children. And it doesn't stop there. You can escape it in time. When you now get to eternity, Jesus now shows up. And I give you an instance. From Revelation chapter 2, from verse 18 to 26, he was addressing one of the seven churches. And this is the church in Titeria. And after he acknowledged all their good works, he now said, I have something against you. And what he had against them was the fact that they allowed for the spirit of fornication to dominate their cycle. And because of that fornication, it caused the servants of God to err. And this is what God said in verse 20. These are the people that have been forgiven in time. Now they have gone to eternity. They are now giving rewards. They were forgiven on earth. But they now come to eternity. God wants to share the word. And God will now tell them. In verse 20. He said, I have forgiven you. But you have no reward in this kingdom. So you came into the kingdom. You were supposed to be an heir. But even in Zion, you will be a stranger. And then what God will do is that. He will now show you the different layers of reward. And one of the layers of reward in Zion is that you will have the right to enjoy fellowship with Jesus. So there are many people who will go to heaven and they will never see Jesus for eternity. Because not everybody will have the opportunity to stay in close proximity with him. Because that one now is for the overcomers. Meanwhile, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, he says, whoever is born of God has overcome the world. When you now go to Revelation, they now say, the overcomers are not just born of God. They have good works. And so the man who is sinning was not given opportunity to have good works in the kingdom. And he now gets to Zion, and then they are distributing. And one of the things they are distributing are nations. And so Revelation chapter 2, verse 26, it's a day that overcome. I will give the right to inherit the nations. Now, let me explain to you what is happening there. Those who never participated in kingdom, when the next world opens up, they will not be allowed to live with Christ in Zion. And so what God will do is that nations that they belong to, they will live in those nations, but those who are overcomers, those nations will now be given to them as inheritances. Okay, let me explain to you what a nation is. Because as I said, nation, you think is Nigeria. <laughs> a nation is not a country. A nation in the spirit is actually a tribe. And if you study it from the biological context, Genesis, for example, chapter 19, when the sons of, the daughters of Noah slept with him, something happened. They gave birth to two nations. One of them is called the nation of Moab. And another one is called the nation of Ammon. Those are two different tribes that came from the loins of Noah. Now, those nations are not the nations of God. Those nations are the nations of the flesh. So the nations is talking about in Revelation are not physical descendants. But I use that to let you know that nations are tribes. In the physical, for example, when you enter the Igbo nation, those are a tribe of people. And even in that nation, there are other little, little nations because they are not all the same. But that's not even what God is talking about. The nation God is talking about are the nations that are born from the intercourse between God and a man. Those are nations born out of encounters. And so when he called Abraham, Abraham belonged to the tribe from the hall of the Chaldees. But God wanted to birth a new nation. And so he said, get thee out of thy country. 
Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. Genesis 12 from verse 1 to 3. And he said, I will bless you and I will make of thee a great nation. So he took him out of the country and made a nation with him. Now, the nation of Israel was a product of the intimacy that existed between Abraham and God. And when you study who Israel is in the spirit, in Romans chapter 9 verse 4, he asked the question, he said, who are the Israelites? And you will think, he will say, it's a people that dwell between the river Euphrates. He's not talking about physical location. He said, who are the Israelites? And he said, to whom pertained the adoption? He said, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the promises unto whom are the fathers. That means Israel in the spirit is not a country. It's a people that are bound by the covenants, the laws, the adoption, the glory of God. That's what defined Israel. Because the encounter that Abraham had with God provided these six requirements to define them. Now, after Abraham, many other nations have risen. There are nations in the order of Enoch. Men that walk with God in the spirit of reverence. There are nations that have risen in the order of Noah. Men that relate with God on the basis of sacrifice. There are nations that rose in the order of Moses. Men that walk with God in the spirit of faithfulness. And it has continued like that for different generations. All of those are the nations. Until today, God is raising nations. Are we together? When a man finds or has an encounter with God and something is born out of that encounter and it defines the philosophy of a people until those people come under the government of God, it becomes a nation in the spirit. And so what God was saying is that if you overcome, not just a man who understands forgiveness, he said a man who overcomes while walking on the earth, he said he will be given the right to rule over those nations. Those are the governors of the realm to come. Because the same way you have governors over state today, you will have governors in the world to come. And he went to Revelation chapter 21. And he said, in that nation, he said, trees will be planted in Zion. And he said, the leaves from those trees will be for the healing of the nations. You know what it means? Those who are in Zion, the byproduct of what comes out of Zion is what they will use to satisfy those who are not able to make it to the mountain of the living God. Meanwhile, on earth, they were taught only forgiveness. They were not taught judgment. And so you will go into Zion and discover that somebody who was your friend on earth will become the governor of the city where you live. Because in the spirit realm, he has inherited that nation. And anything he dictates is what you will obey in Zion. So God is known in his judgments. But you see, believers are not taught. And that's why the world system is designed to bring us to a point where we never amount to anything in the world to come. If the devil can't stop you from giving your heart to Christ, he will stop you from being relevant in the world to come. And the way he will do it is that he will activate lust into your soul. So that while you are on earth, you are pursuing your own advantage. He will activate something called the deceitfulness of riches. And so while you are on earth, you will think this world begins and ends with time. And you will live your life only for pleasure and aggrandizement. He will activate the cares of life. And then you will be living as though you want to kill yourself for what you will eat. Because you will no longer be mindful of the world to come. But wise men who truly know God, when they walk in time, they don't live for time. They live for Zion. Because I would rather be a slave in time and be a governor in the world to come. Because in the world to come, there are different layers of reward. One of the rewards God will give is that you will have the right to live where Jesus lives. That's why I said, the new Jerusalem shall descend from heaven. That's not the nations. That is the new headquarter of heaven. He said it will descend from heaven and he said that city will not need the sun. He said Christ 
will become the son of that city. That means at that level, you will become one with Jesus. But not everybody will be there. Because even in that same scripture, he said outside of the new Jerusalem, he said there will be gnashing of teeth. Meanwhile, this was said in Revelation 21. Judgment had already finished in Revelation 20. Because in Revelation 20 verse 10, he said a white throne appeared. And he said all the races of men ran towards it. And he said books were opened. And he said another book was opened which is the book of life. And he said whomsoever's name is not found in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. So God had already destroyed everybody that does not have eternal life. He is now dealing with those who have eternal life. Who doesn't know him in his judgments. And then some of them, he puts them in the headquarter of the world to come. And they mingle with God as one. That's where the full weight of eternal life will truly be activated. Meanwhile, there are some others who will be in the nations. And they will be depending on the leaves from the tree that grow in Zion for their healing. I don't know what that sickness is. But the Bible said the fruit shall be for the healing of the nations. Because that nation outside requires healing. I want to live in Zion. You see, the, way, the reason we live carelessly is because we were only taught the benevolence of God. We were not taught the judgments of God. And if you don't know the judgments of God, you don't know God. Because as you walk through time, you are going to discover that there are seven layers of knowing God. The first layer of knowing God is the realm of his mercy. In the realm of God's mercy, you don't need to do anything. You are a sinner. He looks for you, finds you, and gives you the word of life and saves you. And so when Paul was teaching in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, he said, God who is rich in mercy, he is rich in mercy because of his love, he has saved us. That's why he said in Romans 5, 8, he said, why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That means we didn't qualify. You didn't qualify. Have you gone to win people to Christ before? And they say the salvation prayer carelessly. Some are even saying it as smoking. Is it true? All right. No problem. Say it, say it. I, I, I came out of service here the other day. I met one guy smoking. And so I walked up to him and said, Brother, I said, do you know you can be delivered from this smoking? He said, well, I don't think I want to. I said, but it's destroying your life. Well, he said, well. I said, you are smoking it because even if you want to stop, you can't. But I know how you can stop. He said, okay. How? I said, I'm trying to explain to you that we are saved by mercy. You are trying to pick, take somebody from hell to Zion. And then he, he doesn't know what it means. As, as I spoke for a while, he looked at it. He dropped it. He said, okay, let me hear you. I spoke for like seven minutes when I finished. He said, okay. If it's true, let's try it. I led him to Christ. When he finished, he said, yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> he didn't know that what he received carelessly, somebody died on the cross in pain to make it available. Somebody fought with principalities and powers and rose from the dead on the third day. For it to come to him, it, it was casual. Because we were saved by mercy. You didn't deserve it. The mercy of God found you. And when God saves you by mercy, he will bring you to the second layer. And the second layer of knowing God is not just on the strength of his mercy anymore. On the second layer of knowing God, he will begin to introduce you to certain things. And what he will introduce you to is his love. He will let you know that he didn't just deliver you so that you'll be saved from judgment. He delivered you so that he can have a relationship with you. And the idea of love is so that fidelity can be established. That's why when John was speaking in John 3.16, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the love of God was what provoked it. You know, because he's called God, he doesn't need anybody. God means self-existent one. That means without you, he is perfect. But without him, you can't exist. That's what God means. He's independent, self-sufficient, self-reliant. 
Everything he needs and will ever need is complete in him. You can't edit him. You can't modify him. He can't grow. God can't grow. He has his growth. There's no, if there's any layer to grow into, that layer is bigger than God. He can't grow. That's why it's called the ancient of days. It's older than time. You can't modify God. There, there's nothing you can do anymore. And God doesn't exist. His existence. Because nothing was before him. All things are in him. So he doesn't need you at all. It is his love that motivated him to bring you into an experience. And so after God shows you mercy, the next thing he introduces to you to is his love. He begins to show you why he saved you. And now that you have known it, like Paul, you will move from the realm of mercy where you are irresponsible, but God is all responsible. You will now come a, deep, a bit deeper. Because in 2 Corinthians 5.14, he said, the love of Christ constrains us. For we thus judge that if one died for all, they that live no longer live for themselves. So your conscience is awoken. Fidelity becomes a requirement. When you want to do things, you now begin to wonder whether God will be happy about it. And when you do things and God is not happy about it, you will have remorse and you will repent. And then you go a bit further from the realm of love, you now come to the realm of grace. In the realm of grace, you begin to know God a bit more. Because in the realm of mercy, you know you don't deserve anything. God just reached out to you. In the realm of love, you still don't deserve anything. But this time around, there's fidelity, there's commitment. Now, when you come to the realm of grace, in your knowledge of God, you will now discover that you will now know that you have some rights. Because in the realm of grace, God did not just save you. Everything he has, he gives you. And so in Romans 8, 17, he said, we are joint heirs with Christ. He said, we are the heirs of God. So you can now come and say, in the name of Jesus. Now you know that you possess the name of Jesus. You can now come and say, by favor, I make progress. You can now come and say, I decree in the name of Jesus. Demons, get out. Because now you know that you are not just a stranger. God did not just bring you in. God has put himself in you. And everything he has, he has given to you. So you migrated from a realm where you don't have any entitlement mentality. You come to a realm where you start learning to be committed to God. And then you now come to a realm where you understand that God is totally committed to you. Because all that God has belongs to you. All of those three operations is what we call it. And it's the lowest realm of knowing God. And that's where many believers are. When they sin, it's not a big deal. But when they have a need, heaven must have to collapse because of them. Because they only know God from the realm of his benevolence. When you migrate from the realm of faith, where all things God possesses is yours, and you have your eternal security in God, you will now begin to travel in God. Because at this time, you are not only there for yourself, you now become reasonable. You now find out, what does God want in this bargain? Because in Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, he said the lost heritage is his people. You have gained God and all that God has. You now begin to ask yourself, what does God want? That's why I told you, you the knowledge of God increases when you come into the judgments of God. And as you migrate from the realm of grace, you now come to the fourth realm, which is the realm of righteousness. In the realm of righteousness, eternal life is now modified into a law. Because the faith you are operating in, in the first three order, was a product of eternal life. But at that level, it was all about the benevolence of God. But when you come to the realm of righteousness, eternal life becomes a law. That's why Paul said, the law of the spirit of life. In Romans 8 verse 2, he said, he has set me free. Because at this time, I know that God who loves all can also judge with anger. And so I become careful to find out what God wants and I begin to obey it. When you come to this level, what God gives to you now is that he commits his glory to you. He can now trust you, so he gives you his glory. The glory of God that he gives to you now makes God to operate with you beyond benevolence. Because his glory is his essence. At that level, God does not forgive. I know many are not taught this. God forgives men at the realm of grace. When you come to the realm of glory, when you become like God, it becomes difficult for you to be forgiven. God may forgive you in the sense that he will not judge you for the sin. But after he removes sin, 
he will still discipline you. There will be recompense. It is in the realm of glory that God can tell you in this season, pray in the night. And then you violate it. And he will now tell you because you failed to pray. The season was supposed to be for six months. Now it will be six years. He has forgiven you. But your wilderness journey is longer. Because you are doing business in the realm of glory. That's where angels live. Angels are creatures of glory. And that's why you see angels, the weapon they use is the jealousy of God. And in the realm of glory, where you function by righteousness, if anything touch you, you don't need to pray. The anger of God will fight for you. When you study the life of Moses, he functioned in the realm of righteousness. When Aaron and Miriam touched Moses, before Moses spoke, the Bible said the glory of God descended and he struck Miriam with leprosy. The reason Aaron was not struck is because he was wearing the effort. And as he wears the priestly garment, he's shielded. But even at that, God didn't forgive him. When they came to Kadesh Benia, he said, say unto Aaron, your brother, let him ascend the mountain and take off his garment. I suspended the judgment, but I didn't forget it. Let him take off his garment. And if you ascend the mountain, he said he will die there in the sight of all Israel so that it will be a memorial. That in dealing with God, there are dimensions and there are layers. Now, we are not designed to fear this realm because this realm empowers us. The reason I'm teaching you this is because if the church does not come to the realm of glory, terrorists will still oppress us. But when we come to the realm of glory, if you come to kill somebody, before you enter, the bomb will detonate with you. The church doesn't need to pray about it. The reason is because the jealousy of God becomes their defense. That's why God rose to defend Moses. Moses didn't need to fight. In fact, Moses began to beg God. And the parable God gave was that if a child violates his father, won't his father spit on his face? He said, let Miriam be separated from the camp for seven days. And they waited for seven days until the leprosy left her. So Miriam returned to the camp in shame. Not because she offended God, but because she offended Moses. Because in the realm of glory, Moses had become a God. The promise that God gave Moses in Exodus 7 verse 1, that behold, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. It's, the one, it's when Moses entered righteousness that that promise was fulfilled. So at that level, if you violate Moses, you are gone. When Korah, Nathan, and Abiram violated Moses, he said, except I'm not a man of God. He said, the earth will open his mouth and swallow you. He didn't pray. He made a decree. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them. In fact, before he did that, he told them, Oh God, sometimes when I study the life of the patriarchs, I tell myself, have we started Christianity? Because they knew secrets that we don't know today. It was that realm that Moses entered on Sinai when he descended. The Bible says his face began to shine. That was when Moses stopped being a mortal. Because when Paul came to define who Moses was, in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, he called Moses the law. He said, when Moses is read. So when you read Genesis, Leviticus, you are reading Moses. Moses was no longer a mortal. And in the realm of glory, he couldn't die. At 120, he said his sight was not dim. Neither was his strength abated. In fact, God had to devise a technology of killing Moses. That was why Moses died in secret. Because he entered a suspended reality. His molecular structure was altered by glory. At that realm, when Moses talks, he's a God. But the problem with that realm is that if you sin, you can't be forgiven. God can remove the iniquity from you, but you will face the penalty. And when Moses violated God, he says, speak to the rock. And Moses did not know that at this level he was doing business among gods. Because the rock he said he should speak to was Christ. Because God had brought him. You know, the Bible said in Isaiah 53 that he pleased God to bruise him. So what God did was that instead of bruising Jesus, he gave Moses the right to do it. Now we have brought you to the name of gods. Participate in the economy of the immortals. Bruise the Christ, but only use words. And Moses showed up and said, the Israelite offended him and he struck the rock. Ah, you have heard. 
You don't know that the rock that traveled between the wilderness is not a stone, it's Christ. And because you have erred, you can't be forgiven. And so when they were about to enter the promised land, he told Moses, go and bless the children of Israel. You will see it, but you won't enter. And when Moses wanted to pray, he said, don't pray to me. Because if you pray, your judgment will be worse. It will provoke anger. So don't pray. You have come into the company of immortals and you don't know that the code of conduct here is righteousness. You don't see in here. We will kill you. And when Moses went down, Moses, be, that was all the secrets Moses had. He didn't say them. He kept them in himself, in his belly because he wanted to enter the promised land with him. But when he discovered he won't make it to the promised land, he stood like a God and he began to talk the destiny of Israel. And one of the things he saw, he said, I saw the Lord descending from Mount Paran and I saw the Holy One. He was saying things that will happen in the battle of Armageddon because Moses had journeyed out of time to the end of time. So he knew the beginning. It's the same Moses that said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because when he entered the league of God, they showed him so those things, the secrets of the earth. Where God stood when he said, light appear, Moses saw it. He was no longer immortal. Did you not read about Paul? He said, I know a man many years ago. Whether he was in the body or in the flesh, I can't tell. He said, that man was carried to the third heaven. And he said, the man was carried to paradise. And he saw things that were unlawful to be uttered among men. And I, the question I ask is, if those things are unlawful to be uttered among men, how did you hear it? That means the realm he entered, he was no longer immortal. He had become an immortal being because the word immortal means without corruption. So you can't allow iniquity to enter you anymore. And so when God judged Moses, he came and spoke to Israel. It was Moses that wrote the foundation of that civilization. He taught them secrets. He knew so much about God. When God's anger fell upon Israel and in one day, 23,000 people died, Moses told Aaron, quickly, Take the golden censer and run and stand between the people and God. When he sees the incense, he will stop. He knew what to do to restrain God. That was the level of secret that the man entered. Stand between the people, no matter how angry he is, when he sees the incense. Because the prayers of the saints. He said they are sent to heaven as others. And they are stored in golden vials. Those are fragrances. So when God perceived those fragrances, his anger will dissipate. And that was how Moses saved Israel. A whole tribe would have been swallowed up. He knew the secrets of Abba. In fact, in Exodus 32, when God was angry, he said, these are his stiff-necked people. I will destroy them and start a new generation with you. He said, far be it from you. He said, repent of these things. How do you want the nations to hear? Is that a man talking? Is the realm of laws when you when you perfect holiness when you perfect righteousness then the powers of the ages to come they are committed to you at that level your walls are no longer for communication even your utterances will be withdrawn because when you speak beyond communication you will create because there was a place God stood and said let the heavens and the earth appear it's a realm it's the realm of righteousness where men stand as God stands the powers that we should wield, they are wrapped in mysteries. But we don't know the secrets of the kingdom. We are quoting scriptures and speaking in capital letter tongues. And the demons are manipulating men and they are oppressing the body. They are assaulting the body, molesting the body. Because we have negated the things that give us authority in the realms eternal. And God told him, he said, ascend the mountain of Nebo. Climb up to the mountain called Abarim. He said, die there. <laughs> Imagine you come to fellowship with God and God said, go and climb to some mountain and die. And you can't pray and say, have mercy. Meanwhile, this was the same man that God said himself can't resist their prayer. In Jeremiah 15 verse 1, he said on this matter, if Samuel and Moses pray, because the height they entered in priesthood, they were the most ranking intercessors until Jesus came. 
No intercessor in scripture had that rank. There are some intercessors that were ranked in scriptures. The first guys that were ranked in the corridor of intercession were Daniel and the likes of Ezekiel. He said if they pray for a city, they will save themselves, but they can't save the city. But when it came to Moses and, and Samuel, their level of intercessory power was different. But on this matter, he said, you can't pray to me. Go and die. And Moses carried himself and went and died. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you see why the devil can allow you fornicate and still heal the sick? Because that's mundane. The real powers in the spirit, they are beyond healing. They are men that can speak to the wind and say, let the east wind come and fill the bodies and a great army can rise. For such powers, it's not a gift. It is to walk in the realm of righteousness. Dimensions that are hollow, only mortals can wield them. And so the devil has no problem with you prophesying. Add fornication to it. Because he knows that with your prophecy, he will still take the city. You can have congregation. You can have a large member. But the city belongs to him. Because princes don't fight for men. They fight for territories. It's demons that fight for men. And so when princes come, they are contending for the city. And we will never have the power to take the city until we know the way of righteousness. That's why no man can stand up and banish the sons of the bondwoman. But in the days of Samuel, he says, so long as Samuel lived, he said the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistine. Samuel didn't need to pray. So long as he was breathing, no bandit can come close to Zion. Because if you try it, you will be converted. Did you not read about Saul? When he came to arrest Samuel, the moment he touched the borders of Nioth in Ramah, the Bible said he prophesied naked from night until morning because the hand of God was a defense. But check those men. The power they wielded was not an anointing. It was called righteousness. When Samuel was old, he stood before Israel. He said, let one of you accuse me. Let one man, one, I've never taken a lamb from you. I've never robbed any of you. I've never withheld anything from you. Let one man accuse me. And not one man in Israel could stand up and say something against him. And when they didn't have an accusation, he showed us the display of righteousness. And he said, this is dry season. He said, but now let the cloud pour down. And rain began to fall in dry season. There are powers in the spirit that is superior to a gift. Those are the garments of righteousness. And until the bride of Christ grows into her stature in righteousness, we cannot say to the devil, hold your peace. When you finish your work, don't be left with a gift. Your gift will be corrupt. It will become a monument. Leave the earth with the garment of righteousness. Because even when Jesus returns on the white horse, he said those who will come with him, he said they are without spot. Because their garments have been washed in the blood. It is righteousness that gave them stature in Zion. And so when you grow from the realms of righteousness, you will come to a higher realm. That realm is called the realm of the fear of the Lord. Ah. 
the fear of the Lord. When you enter the realm of the fear of the Lord, God begins to give you keys in the spirit. That means you become a custodian. What God wants to do is that he begins to hide dimensions with you and in you. So you have the power to unlock things and to close them. That was the realm Daniel was operating in, in Babylon. When they told them to eat anything they want, they said Daniel and his friends refused to be defied with the portion of the king's meat. The reason is because they feared God. They feared the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we will not be careful to answer you in this matter. We fear God more than your throne. And the king said, make the fire seven times hotter. They were not moved. They were so bound by the fear of the Lord that they became prisoners of God. And when God was working with Daniel at the latter age of his life, he told him, seal the book. I've given you the power to hide things and even angels can't find them. He says, seal it, lock the book. The person that came to unlock the book was Paul the apostle. That was why Paul said, it is given to me the mysteries and I have the power to make men see. The things that were locked for aeons, I have entered the rank where Daniel operated. I can unlock the mysteries. And this is why Paul became the custodian of the mysteries of Christ. Because those mysteries were revealed to Daniel. Remember, when Daniel was sojourning with God, he said, I saw, he saw the courts of heaven open. And he said, he saw one that looked like the ancient of days. His hair was white as wool. God was showing him the powers that the Christ will reveal. But when it was not the time, God now told Daniel to lock it. Nobody could unlock it until Paul showed up. And when Paul showed up, he opened the mysteries of Christ. And anybody can tap into Paul in order to access those mysteries. It was Paul that taught us what the church is. It was Paul that taught us what it meant to be a witness. It was Paul that taught us who we are in Christ. All of those mysteries were locked. Daniel locked it. Paul came to unlock it. And the reason is because Paul was a man that trembled at God. When Paul was going to Jerusalem, he said, I go to Jerusalem bound in the spirit. So even if it doesn't please him, so long as he pleases the master, Paul was willing to do it. He had then that mystery. And that mystery is not only to write scriptures. And that's why I'm sharing these things. That mystery made Paul invincible. Paul spoke and he said terrible things. He said, a day and a half I was in the deep. Paul fell into the ocean. And they didn't find him until one and a half day. When they removed him, he was alive. So Paul was like an amphibian. He could, he could operate on earth and he could operate in the belly of the sea. You couldn't kill him. Because of what? He had mysteries. Those mysteries were so ingrained that he made him to become anything under any circumstance. He said, I can abound. I can abase. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Because of the realm of the fear of the Lord. The mysteries of God open. Hope you know that Psalm 25 verse 14, the Bible said the fear of the Lord. The, he said the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Not with them that pray. Not with them that fast. The secrets of God is with them that fear him. He will show them his covenants. That's why Paul said we are the servants of Christ. Therefore, we are the stewards of the mysteries of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he became a custodian. And so, Paul was so powerful that Paul was bold enough to tell the church in Ephesus. He said, when I leave you, he said, wolves, ravenous wolves will come. You know what Paul was saying? That was the same prayer Jesus prayed for his disciples. He said, all that you have given me I have kept. None has been lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. The same power Jesus had to protect the church. That was the power Paul carried. And he said, so long as he was in Ephesus, nothing could happen to the church. He said, but the moment he departs, he said, wolves will come into their rank. That means Paul was a guardian. Because of the access to mysteries that he had, you couldn't penetrate the church when Paul was around. 
and that was not read in the book. He said, the message I preach, I was not taught of any, any man. He said, when he pleased the father, who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal Christ in me, I confess not with flesh and blood. I went to Arabia. All they taught us is human connection. That's why we are weak. The ways of Babylon. How to manipulate men and build relationship. That's all they taught us. They will tell you, make sure you call once in a week. And when you are visiting, take a gift. And then you see Christians operating in mundane wisdom. Wisdom that is built on selfishness and self-centeredness. When somebody needs you, he packages something. And he presents it as if he's honoring you. That's what they taught us. And that's how they taught us to manage relationships. But in the word of Paul, they built relationship in the spirit. He said, I went to Jerusalem by revelation. Galatians chapter 2 verse 2. I went by revelation. After 14 years, that was when God told him, now meet Peter. It wasn't a manipulative relationship for acceptance, for visibility, or for validation. He went by revelation. Because their own relationship is born in the spirit. They had enough power, not just to be protected, but to guard the people. If Paul comes to our midst here, nothing can happen to us. The same way Jesus is in our midst, nothing will happen. Paul can come like that. Did you not read what he said? He said, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. He said, but I'm found to be trustworthy. And so what he said became scriptures. How can the Holy Ghost not inspire you and you write something and it becomes scripture? Because he was functioning in the realm of the fear of the Lord. And so long as you operated in that realm, the secrets of God are within. That's why I began by telling you, it's not every challenge you use faith. Some challenges you need discernment. Some challenges, you need secrets so that you will be 10 steps ahead of the enemy. It's not every battle you fight, you will waste your arsenals. There are some battles that mysteries and secrets will cause you to avoid. But if you don't have these things, you will waste yourself. And he said, the labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because they know not how to enter the city. The labor of the foolish and when you leave the realm of the fear of the Lord then you come to the sixth realm it's called the realm of the knowledge of the holy that's where God commits to you the powers of eternal life because knowledge is not for you to increase in fact when your knowledge is fact he say your mind will be puffed Knowledge actually brings liberty. He said, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. And knowledge actually transform you. We all with open faces, beholding us in the glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. So the knowledge of the holy turns you to become a visible expression of the invisible God. Because that's what God created. Let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. But you can never come to that level except as you migrate from the realm of mercy through the realm of love into the realm of grace. And then you come to the realm of righteousness. You come to the realm of the fear of the Lord. And then you come to the realm of the knowledge of the holy. These are the things that give the church her true power. And that's why when the devil attacks us, what he attacks are the things that prevent us from making progress in the spirit. When he said the part of the just is as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. It's not that today you didn't have money, tomorrow you have money, next tomorrow you buy a house, you now buy a car, and you say, I'm growing. That's mundane. No, it's not, that's not the part of the just. That's the part of a wise businessman. But when Christianity is watered down, we judge our value system by the standard that the world gives. If that is your own part of the just, that means Dangote will buy your whole lineage. 
<laughs> you move into depths and dimensions in God until you come to a point where when they see you, they see him. That's where Jesus operated. In the realm of the knowledge of the holy. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's my greatest asset. If you have seen me, and because he has become like the Father, everything the Father can do, he can also do. You now discover that the things men pursue will become a byproduct. That's why testimonies are not necessarily cast. We say that to encourage people so that we can appreciate God's benevolence. But beyond that, testimonies are the level of access you have in the spirit. Because when you are sent in the spirit, the material world will respond. The material world was designed to respond to the spiritual world. I said that to let you know that God is known in his judgment. If you stop at the realm of grace, you don't know God. You will have to come to the realm of righteousness. That's why he said in 1 John 3.10, little children, let no man deceive you. 3.7, he said, him that doeth righteousness is righteous. And in 1 John 3.10, he said, him that is born of God, sineth not. It's not just I'm forgiven. Is that as he is, so am I, or I am in this world. You move from the realm of righteousness to the realm of the fear of the Lord. And then you come to the realm of the knowledge of the holy. You really have the mind of Christ. You think what he thinks. And you live as though Christ was the one living through you. Which is actually the reality. And in Galatians 2.20, Paul made us understand that he attained that realm. Say the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God that died for me. God is known not just in his benevolence, God is also known in his judgments. I can assure you that more than 90% of the believers of this age, they don't know God in his judgments. That's why our world is lawless. Many pastors don't know God in his judgments. The reason is because the messages they are even preaching now are the messages they recycled from a century ago. It's what E.W. Kenyon taught, that Kenny Hagin taught. That's what all of them are teaching to date. People have not pressed deeper and say, Father, open virgin dimensions to us. And when we catch the revelation of Kenny Hagin, catch the revelation of E.W. Kenyon, and cripples begin to walk, blind eyes begin to see, we now build Babel. We migrate from Zion. We enter into Babel. We are supposed to start from those revelations. But God is a movement. It's a river that will never end. It's a river we keep exploring because there is a heritage of knowledge that is left for our generation. All of us read those books. But the body of Christ is going forward. And now we have known enough of the benevolence of God. It's time to know God in his judgment. When you read the writings of Paul, you will discover that the ratio of grace to works is about 65 is to 35. When you go to Revelation, the ratio of grace to work is about 20 to 80. Because as you migrate towards the end of time, the value system it's not just what God did for you. It's not what you can do for God. Because while he's dealing with us individually, he's also dealing with us as a body. Now, having established this foundation, let me show you the 12 layers of the spirit realm. That's my message. Ah. <laughs> my brothers and sisters, you see, we can't teach the word of the Lord. We can't teach it. Because if you even begin to talk the heavy matters, you will lose your audience. They, they will not know where you are going to. Because all they are used to is give, it shall be given unto you. Good measures, press down, shake it together. And you see, Christian. <laughs> all our giving is bargain. 
when they kneel down to pray, isha baja, isha baja. somebody is in the hospital. The moment they discharge the person, they will wrap their altar and go and keep it till the next day problem comes. <laughs> you see somebody, ah, 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 is looking for a wife. The moment he catches the gaze of that lady, the next thing he's in Dubai, snapping like this. There's nothing wrong with those things. I went for honeymoon to so. But I'm trying to let you know there are deeper things. And you know, sometimes they are hard to teach. Oh, they are hard. That's why we break, you know, the way people should sit in church is not just a large congregation. It's according to generations. When you check Israelites, when they moved, they either sat, they sat according to their tribes and in the tribe, they sat according to their generations. When church really becomes interested in establishment, we can't be 10,000 in one audience. Who will you talk to? There are those you can say strong things to and there are those that you need to say little, little things to because we are in different generations in the spirit. That's why sometimes you hear us preach where we touch some strong meat we will now come back and explain smaller matters. And people will hear you and say, ah, this man has lost it. You don't preach what you know. You preach based on your audience. If I meet young believers, I can't be telling them deep kingdom matters. They don't even know the benevolence of God. You start talking judgment. They will, they will leave you and go home. But people just sit on the internet, cross their leg, and be marking where you are in your walk with God. The other one saw me the other wrote on the other day and said, the kind of people this man is mingling with, he will soon fall into error. I laughed. Me, I know my calling. I'm not a pastor. I'm a revivalist. I'm sent to the body. The good, the bad, and the ugly. When I meet the good, I strengthen their faith. When I meet the bad, I convict them by the word. When I meet the ugly, I bring the judgment of God until they repent. It's church organization that people create different factions. I'm not a factionist person. I'm sent to the body. That's why Jesus saw Zacchaeus. He said, come down. Today I'm coming to your house. Tomorrow you see Jesus in a banquet with the Pharisees. Banquet. The worst set of people in the damn world were tax collectors and Pharisees. They looked at him. They said, he's a friend of publicans. This is a fake prophet. When the harlot came and poured perfume on his leg, they said, ah, if he's a prophet, he should have known that this is a harlot. Jesus said, those who are well don't need a doctor. It is those who are sick that need doctor. I know my calling. I'm a revivalist. I'm not a pastor. If I'm a pastor, I'll go and look for the people that preach my kind of message. I'm sent to the body. That's why we mingle with genuine people. We also mingle with fake people. We are the salt of the body. If we create faction, some people will be lost forever. And they will not just be lost. Their congregation will be lost. So if I enter the camp of the fake people, even if they refuse to repent, because not everybody Jesus met repented. Zacchaeus repented. Judas never repented. But even if they choose to, choose not to repent, at least some of their followers will hear us and they will know that what their papa is saying is fake. <laughs> That's why we mingle with everybody. And so if you think we will lose our calling by mingling with people, you have not seen anything. Because this man talking here, I can even enter a herbal shrine. The Christianity of self-preservation, you want to preserve your name and be a good person. Some of us don't have a name. We are called apostles. That's our work. And if you think that I don't know Jesus enough, that I meet a fake prophet or a fake believer and he will convert me, then I need to stop preaching and go back. That means I didn't graduate from the school of the Spirit. I didn't graduate. If a man 
can still change me. My encounters are fake. But if my encounters are not fake and you think because of preserving my name, I will create factions. I'm not part of those people. I am sent to the body. I strengthen the genuine. I convict the fake. And we judge the diabolic. Because Jesus feasted with Zacchaeus. He feasted with the Pharisees. He carried prostitutes as his disciples. And even the son of perdition followed him till he died. Some look at you. You preach a strong message today. They now hear another message. They say, Kai, this man is no longer preaching the message we know him for. Ah, I'm a traveler. I'm an itinerant preacher. I can go to a place today and I see strong believers and we talk deep matters. I will go to another place tomorrow and I will find only babes. I will give them what they can handle. You are online hearing all the messages. You don't know that I preach one in Jalingo, I preach the other one in Meduguri, and I preach the other one in Enugu. I'm not talking to the same people. That's why you hear Paul, you hear John. At one point, he said, if you sin, ask for forgiveness. At another point, he said, if you sin, Jesus will ask for forgiveness for you. At another point, he said, we don't sin. You now hear one person saying three different things. You say, this is contradiction. No, he's talking to different levels of maturity. And that's why the apostles are called wise master builders. I can go to a congregation and tell them, whatever you do, God has forgiven you. I will see a mother and say, God has forgiven and forgotten. Come to the Lord. That's what we do on crusade ground. But when we come to discipleship ground, we will tell you that in the world to come. But if you carry the world to come to a crusade ground, they will go home. So you that is on the internet, judging those who are accurate and those who are fake, why not go to the mission field for one year? I just came back from Jalingo. My whole body is aching. We ministered fire and brimstone this morning in Jalingo. And then we came back. Meanwhile, I flew six hours overnight from London to Abuja two days ago. The next day I went to Jalingo. Today I'm here. Tomorrow I'm going to Milan. Sometimes you stand up in the morning, your waist is like this. <laughs> because you can't bend well. Meanwhile, we are young. This is when we should carry our yoke. He said, bear your yoke in your youth. Because very soon, when you are 50, you can't do anything again. Then you consolidate. So the spirit realm and spiritual realities are deep. Twelve layers of the spirit realm. This place, there is maturity here. So let's say some things. You know what I'm trusting God for? That a governor in the days when God raises our horn, a governor can lead prayers. And people will fall under the anointing. A governor. Prayer is not for the poor. It's for everybody. Priesthood is not for preachers. It's for everybody. Because without priesthood, there can be no kingship. Your kingship operates on your priesthood. That's why we are called priests and kings. My prayer is that we will grow to a level where a senator will come, will not just usher them to sit in front. No. When we need to do impartation, a senator will lay hands on people and they will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Everyone will be strong. Let me list them in case I don't finish so that you will go and do your study. There are 12 orders in the spirit realm the first is that the spirit realm is a legalistic realm that means it is a realm governed by laws if you are lawless you have no place there you are a victim on arrival number two the spirit realm is a realm of secrets you can open a door now in the spirit realm and enter when you open the same door and come back, you are in another world. You are the only one that thinks the door is parallel. Different realms are mingled. You can take one step in the spirit realm and when you look, 
it will be 50 years. You take the same step backward. You will think you came back to where you left. When you look, it will be 90 years into the past. You now come back to where you look now to see what you were seeing. You will still go to the past. So you can be going forward and going to the past and going backward and going forward. It's a mingled and intermingled realm. That's why you can't master God. What you did today, did tomorrow, you now say, I found a formula. The third time you do it, you fail. Because every time you operate, the only governor of that realm is the Holy Ghost. He's the one to tell you that match here is stone. You may see stone, and as you march, it's a river. That's why I told Moses, talk to the rock. The rock was a river. That's the spirit realm. Is guided by secret. Guarded by secret. Number three, the spirit realm is the realm of thrones. That means we are not the same. If you are arrogant, a prince sitting on a higher throne can lock you out for a season. What you command is a function of the throne you are operating from. And I will show you scriptures. I just want to list it. Number four, the spirit realm is a realm of life and death. It is run and ruled by life and death. And so everything you are doing in that realm, you are either giving expression to life or you are giving expression to death. I can be talking here and talking intelligently, but everything I'm saying is death. You will hear me and fall into fornication. You can hear me and fall into immorality. You can hear me and bad luck will come on you. And it's also possible if I'm functioning with life, you will hear me and the power of immorality will break. Not because you try to discipline yourself. You can also hear me and you will just step into favor. What was standing for 12 years will just change in two weeks. Not because you are praying, but life was being emitted. That's why Jesus said, the words I speak. He said they are spirit and they are life. And they walks, the walls, Satan speak. They are spirit and death. That's how the spirit realm works. And that's why I say life and death is in the power of the tongue. He said they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So it's a realm of life and death. Number five, the spirit realm is a realm of sounds. Sounds. The vehicle of transport in the natural can be a Lamborghini. But in the spirit, the vehicle of transport is sound. When you hear sound, a spirit is moving. He said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they heard the sound as of a rushing mighty wind. Suddenly, the Holy Ghost fell upon them. So he traveled on sound. The Bible said, at the end of time, he said, the Son of Man shall descend with a shout. So that shout is not screaming. It's a transport model. And he said, they will descend with the voice of the archangel. And he said, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. So what will take us to heaven is a sound. So every sound you hear in the spirit carries something. That's why you can hear some sound. You now hear that sound. After you hear it for a while, that sound will transport you to immorality. You will hear a sound. After a while, that sound will transport you to depression. You will hear a sound. After a while, that sound will transport you to violence. Those days when we used to watch football, when you come into the Champions League, there is a sound that Heineken designed from Hades, from the pit on here. The, the, the sound is, a, is an afflictor of the soul. If you like, be in the prayer room. If that Champions League match is 8 o'clock, the moment is 7 10, you will start hearing. Tan, 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 tan. You will fall from Zion. You will fall down from your prayer out. <laughs> if you are not in that match, you will start seeing the vision of the match. The sound came from Hades. It bound us to football for many years. You are the one who thinks a sound is for entertainment. You are mobilizing demons. And you can also mobilize angels by sound. That's why in heaven, 247, there are sounds playing. 
because angels are worshipping and they are moving. The motions of that realm functions on sound. I was teaching the other day, I told them, they say, BB Niger. And somebody will own it from morning to night for three months. Even your child that is six months old, those sounds are entering him. They are vibrations. Energy is entering him. You will not know who will teach him how to watch pornography at the age of five. You will use all the koboko that is in this world. What you don't know is that you mobilize spirit into him. Because a spirit doesn't need to talk to travel. They will inject themselves into you and bind you for years. Sound. Why do you think when they produce a good sound in your direction, you smile? And when they say a wrong sound, your mood changes immediately. You think sounds are not spiritual. It's a realm of sound. The operations of spirit travel on sounds. Number six is the realm of light. And I told you already, authority is a function of light. The level of access a man carries is a product of the light that he commands. When God showed up and spoke to Job, he said, declare now if you have understanding. He said, where were you when I formed the foundation of the earth? the boundary of the ocean. That means the authority that God used to put it in order was a product of light. And he asked Job, if you think you have understanding, speak. He said, can you talk to lightning and they will come to you and say, here we are. He said, do you know where darkness dwell? He was showing Job the kinds of authority that he wields because of the light where he dwells. And he said, if you think you can do it, where is your own light? Where is your own understanding? The moment a man catches light, he catches authority. Number seven, the spirit realm is a realm of thoughts. Communication in that realm is higher on the frequency of thought than it is with words. Words are highly limited. You can speak in one direction per time, but your thought can speak in diverse direction. You can be thinking of somebody and while you are thinking of that person, you are seeing the image of that person. You are also seeing what you want to do to that person. You are also seeing what will happen to that person when you are done doing what you want to do to that person. So thought can operate different dimensions at the same time. Words can't do that. Words are monodimensional. Thoughts are multifaceted. There are multiple dimensions allocated to thought. And so when you go to the spirit realm, because they don't want limitation, they take words out. They use thought to communicate. That's how it works. And you cannot even speak correctly except as your thought goes to work first. It is superior to what trans. And they say God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. That means the same way God responds to your words in response to your thought. Number eight, the spirit realm is a realm of faith. You move things in that realm not because you have muscles. Your muscle in the spirit realm is your faith. A man who has no faith is defeated in that realm because that realm, God collects things that be not as though they are. That means your faith is what brings things to bear. If your faith is not there, you will have no stake in that realm. And this is why we hear the word of God, because we want to build our faith quickly. That realm was built by faith. And that's why he said, by faith, the elders obtain a good, a good report. Number eight. Number nine. The spirit realm is a realm of love. The only way you can express yourself in that realm is either by love or by wickedness. When you speak, when you give, it's all an expression of the language either of love or of wickedness. That's how the realm works. If you are in the dimension of God, the realm is governed by love. I was speaking to one of my sons yesterday. God is using him to do mighty things. 
he will jump online like this and say something violently. And somebody reached me. He said, those of you young ladies that are coming here looking for husband, I'm not available. If that's why you came, get out. And then the next thing, you'll see him praying for people on the road. I say, God, this is not the spirit of Christ. You don't have the right to talk because you have a tongue. There are three laws that governs your speech in this kingdom. Number one, you speak words that are full of grace. He said, let thy words be what? Full, seasoned with grace. Number two, he says, speaking the truth in love. You speak in love. And number three, he said, Peter, filled with the spirit, stood up and spoke. You speak by the spirit of faith. If there is no love, and if there is no grace in your words, your faith becomes arrogance. That's how the spirit realm works. When you want to speak to somebody, put yourself in that person's shoe. Find out if he hears it, how will he feel first? Before you have the right to say it. There are times when the Holy Ghost comes judgmentally. But because it comes from love, people will be edified or they will be convicted. But if it's not the Holy Ghost, you will destroy people's personalities. And when God gives you authority, it's worse. The spirit realm is a realm of love. If you are not walking in love, you are walking in wickedness. Number what? Ten. The spirit realm is the realm of judgment. And judgment in this, in this context operates on the frequency of faithfulness. That means you can't be promoted except as you are found faithful. You say number one, if you are not faithful in another man's business, who will give you yours? That means, before God can trust you with your own ministry, before God can trust you with your own business, he will not take the risk of giving it to you. He will take you to another person's home and have you walk there and you will walk with your heart as if it's your own. When you pass, he will now say, come, you can now handle this. It's faithfulness that determines promotion. That's how the judgment of that realm works. It's a realm of judgment. Number 11, the spirit realm is a realm of eternity. It has no beginning. It has no end. Because it began with God and it will end with God. Time only rules the natural realm. But the spirit realm is not regulated by time. And finally, the spirit realm is a realm of spirits. If you don't have spirit, you can't participate there. That's why donkeys don't have a stake there. That's why you can come and look at your goat and say, today is my birthday. You will slaughter the goat. Nothing will happen. If you slaughter a being that has a spirit, the blood of that being will rise up and bring a case against you in the courts of heaven. Goats don't have spirit, so you can kill 1,000 in one day. But when you kill a being that has a spirit, his spirit will trace the court of heaven. And when Cain killed Abel, he thought he did it in hiding. And God showed up and he said, Cain, Cain, where is thy brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, oh, the blood of your brother is crying to me from the ground. That means it's, it's, you can't die. That's why even when we leave this world, we are called spirit of just men made perfect. The spirit we carry makes us eternal. And so the reason you can participate in the spirit realm is because you have a spirit. You may not have known how to hear the voice of God, but you can hear demons. You are, you are a vital and a functional part of that realm. The moment God put a spirit in you, you become a participator in the spirit realm because it's a realm of spirit. I want to begin with no time. Go and develop it. It's a manual. I would have spoke up, spoken about the legalistic dimension of that realm. So you see how that realm works. 
Everything must balance. Everything. There's no vacuum in that realm. Let me give you an instance. Talking about the legalistic dimension. When God wanted to save man, there was an equation. And those of you who hear me, you know this already. Four teams insist that there must be balance. The wrath of God, the Bible said, is released against all unrighteousness. And the position of the wrath of God is that the wages of sin is death. So no matter what God does, in order to forgive man, death must happen. Because of wrath, there's no way forgiveness can happen without death. But at the same time, there is the mercy of God that says the sinner must be let go. Because James 2.13 said, mercy prevails over judgment. Wrath say you will die. Mercy say you can die. So God naturally would have been left in a dilemma. But why God was contemplating that and wanted to pull out, I said, okay, since there is a crisis, let the man die. The love of God now show up. I said, no, he can't die. You love this man. How can he die? And so because God does not have any other choice, since there must be a balance between wrath, mercy, and love, God decided to leave his throne, take off his body, put the body of man, become a man, and die for man. You will say, ah, are you not the sovereign God? Just say you are forgiven. No, he's in the spirit realm. And in the spirit realm, you can't just wake up and say, I forgive you. Among men in the natural, you can steal something from me and you come and say, sorry, I beg, don't be angry. When I look at you, even if you are manipulating me, my heart will be somehow, I will forgive you. In the spirit realm, God can't. He can't just look at you and say, forgive him. He can't. If he does that, he will deny himself. And so, the only way is that you must die. And so what God did was that God took your place. In taking your place, his love and mercy was manifested. And in dying, his wrath was also manifested. That's how legalistic God is. And God didn't stop there. After he died for you, he now gave you grace. So that you will live above that sin. Because if you go back, there will be consequences. It's a legalistic realm. If you know how the spirit realm works, you will guide your life carefully. Jesus said something. He said, every idle word a man speaks, he said, he will account for it. The reason you talk anyhow is because you don't know how legalistic. You think because you said it at the age of 19, when you are 50 years old, time has passed. <laughs> On the last day, that word will stand up and start walking. And say, you spoke me. I am here now. <laughs> you know if you know the spirit realm, you will tremble. Jesus spoke. He said, these words have spoken today. He said, they will rise up against you in judgment. Because wars will walk. They will walk into the courtroom. When you want to deny, your word will come and say, don't you recognize me? <laughs> you can't speak carelessly. That's why when you start maturing, you, you guide your word. I taught you maturity. I told you, he said, him that is perfect, has rule over his tongue. Why do you think many children are wayward? From the age of two to the age of nine, all the causes in this world, their parents use anger to release it on them. When they now mature, they go and trouble God every day. Help my son. Which son? The one you have destroyed with your tongue. You hear good for nothing. Foolish boy. Wayward boy. You don't have any hope in this life. She claims she's angry. When the anger comes down, the word will remain as a witness. Because the realm is legalistic. Let's stop here.
stands up and he says, even when he's cracking joke, I don't die. And then the I don't die is filling up. When the quorum is complete, nothing on earth can deliver him. A boss can just shift into a gutter. Out of 27 persons, he will be the only person that dies. Because when he was saying it, he was filling a cup. He didn't know. When that cup is full, the legality of the spirit realm will insist that you die. He, he thinks he's joking, but in that realm, they are documenting your utterance. It's legalistic. Somebody stands up. You say, what is happening? He say, nothing is working. Well done. You may need 10 years of intercession to change the things you have said. Nothing is working. The Bible said, when men are cast down, say. He didn't say when men say there's a casting down. Men are really cast down. He said, but be careful. You are dealing in a legalistic world. Don't be part of them. Even when you are down, say there's a lifting up. He said, let no one in Zion, let no one say I am sick. The doctor can say what he wants. There's a challenge I'm dealing with. I will never, never say it. Because it's a legalistic realm. You ask somebody, say, ah, my money don't finish. My money doesn't finish. I may not have cash now, but I have money. Because so long as I have value, I have money. You will never. I know the legalities of the realm. These things we teach is to give you an advantage in life. You stand up, you say your wife is good for nothing because you are quarreling. When you settle that quarrel, be waiting for the good for nothing. It's coming. You are building something. Did you know what, read what the Bible said? It said that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. The word is remata. That means you can shape her into anything. Because you call it, you say you are a wayward person. Wait for that accumulated waywardness. When it comes, you will kneel down and beg God for 10 years to alter the things you have created. remember you will manifest them in this life you are the head and the head only all your ways in righteousness will prosper where men fail you will succeed where men fall you will stand and every idle word you have spoken until now under this corporate unction we cancel it we decree a new season emerges for you the Holy Ghost for one minute. Yeah. 
to your business and prophesy over it for one month. Because you have killed that business with your words. You, you killed it. You may need to go and prophesy over that business for one month before your utterances are able to change the things you have created. Some of you need to prophesy over your children for six months for them to ever count again. You have killed them even before they manifest them. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance over you. And may the Lord give you peace. You're going out and you're coming in is blessed. None of your steps shall slide. All your ways will shine forth. And the hand of God will remain upon you perpetually. Prosper. Excel. Become mighty. And rule in life. So let it be written. And so let it be established. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. You were blessed by this message you just listened to and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior kindly repeat the prayer after me dear Heavenly Father I believe in your son Jesus Christ and that he died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.ejmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.